Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Breath of Fire 2. Last episode, we recruited our last new party member, Aspara the Grassman. Uh, to sum up what I said about him last episode, he's a pretty good character, not good enough to be in my active party, but he gets exit and warp at levels 18 and 19 which will allow us to finally fast travel and get out of dungeons without death warping. And more importantly, he, we need him to get into the Sea of Green because he can walk through trees. But first, let us take out that Zenny we've been storing up because we're going to do a lot of shopping very shortly. And also, yeah, we're storing one of the coins since I don't need both of them and they're taking up inventory space but i do need one to do some fishing coming up soon joining me to see all of this is skyzo how you doing buddy i'm doing well hello youtube now tapeta mentioned this sea of green being below his castle and aspara also said to go left to that same sea of green because we need to talk to the elder tree to figure out why the trees near the town of gate are dying so that's why we're doing all of this right although i feel like i'm not sure yeah i don't think this is connected to the the greater plot right no it well it kind of is. It's about the only objective we have at this point. Also, fun fact, the kana for the Elder Tree's name, Gandharv, you can actually translate it as Gandalf if you want. In fact, some other characters are actually translated as that in other games with the same characters. So, I guess Ryu Sui thought that would be too obvious, so he went with this instead. But it's a fun fact. Also, the tree has a speech impediment. It's a nice bonus. And I asked about the plot because I feel like so far it's been a long journey. And I don't know about the progress that we've made, right? It feels like it's we haven't done too much progress, although we've been at this for a little while, so... That is... not an incorrect observation, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Anyways, I am finally gonna show you what fishing looks like. But first, we have to spawn a random encounter. And hey! New battle music! Check this out, Skyzo. Sounds better. Better? Or is it just nice to hear a new piece of music? I'd say both, to be honest. This sounds a little more... I don't know, threatening. I agree. It's even called Dying Corpse in the soundtrack. I don't know why visiting the Elder Tree was the exact trigger for this. I would have put it immediately after Trout and that ominous cutscene with the eye, but hey, we have it now. I feel like this is a good indication that this is the middle of the game. Yeah. Anyways, we have a fish now. Now these spawn in around like 23 or 24 different spots around the overworld but they have about a 50% chance of appearing every time you get out of a random encounter, but only in certain spots. And if you do find them, you want to equip a fishing rod and a lure of the relevant type onto Ryu. In this case, we're looking for something called a Monero. So we have a coin equipped instead. And do you see that power meter in the upper left, Skyzo? Well, not this uh, instant, but yeah, now I do. Yeah, so that determines how far you throw, but you don't have complete control over it. It's sort of a timing thing. But once you do get the Monero in your fishing rod, you've got him. You just press A to lure him in. 
And since it's a sapient creature and not something we eat, we are going to buy stuff from him. Because Mineros are something of a legacy character from Breath of Fire 1 as well. They were fish merchants that sold stuff. It's quite interesting. So it's something that returns. I like that. Yeah. And we're gonna sell all our excess gear, although I should have kept the glass helm. It's Lean's only decent piece of headwear for a long time. Wasn't too important, so I didn't re-record for it, but... Anyways, you see how the speed shoes say they improve initiatives? Yeah. Remember what I was talking about regarding that? Yeah, I do. Um, apparently your odds are very poor in this game. That and the fact that that what was supposed to happen with the speed shoes only happens if you have an empty inventory slot and the first character's accessories instead. The speed shoes, they increase your vigor by 10, so you want them for Sten, but they don't increase your initiative rate. Huh. That's bizarre. Yeah, it's something to do with the game accidentally setting a value instead of an address. But anyways, here is our next objective. We need to get a therapy pillow to get inside the Elder Tree's head because, unfortunately, he's starting to forget all the important things that we wanted him for. So, we need a master's flute, though, to talk to these people because they only speak in music, and then we can ask them for the therapy pillow. Lots of things going on in this plot now. Could you imagine only being able to speak in music? It sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> in any case, the other items... The Holy Scarf, for example? You'll notice we have Sten in the lead right now. Do you know why? Well, why's that? Because he has the Holy Scarf equipped. It acts as a permanent smoke bomb. Permanently decreases all random encounters by about half. But it only activates if the character wearing it is in front of the marching order. Not in slot one! in front of the marching order, which you change with L and R, so remember that. And no, they don't stack with smoke bombs, so smoke bombs are now obsolete. What a bizarrely specific set of conditions for that item. This game is weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, a quirky game, I'd say. And last but not least, we want to swap around Ryu and Sten's equipment, you'll see why later. And as for the Courage Belts, those increase your attack by 10 for each one you're wearing, so that's why we spent the rest of our Zenny on getting 5 of them. That's fair enough. Speaking of Courage, Sten really does not seem to want to visit this place again, does he? Nope. Absolutely not. I wonder if this has to do with what we learned about him in that church that one time. That was a bizarre moment. I imagine this is his arc, right? Just as it happened with the frog character. Indeed. And this part of the game is, well, it showcases a lot of Breath of Fire 2's best and worst qualities all in one palace. And fortunately, we're going to circumvent the worst qualities since we have a properly leveled Sten. So as far as just the story goes, this is one of the highlights, I would say. It's one of the few times where the game actually drops the quirky and silly act. Just like Sten himself, now that I think about it. I feel like this is one of those... I almost want to say like a milestone for this game, where there's character development and it's like very emotional, right? Well, not too emotional, but it's yeah. touching in a way. 
Yeah. Huh? Uh... Turbo isn't dead, is he? Oh, I guess not. He would get a kick out of seeing him again. What a strange, like, section this is. Actually, is it Turbo or is it Trubo? It depends on the translation, I guess. Well, this is a better translation, so I'd go with that. Fair enough. <sighs> well, Sten is still having trouble coming to grips with whatever, so for this part of the game, he is just gonna leave us to find it on our own. And then I guess we'll get him once we're ready to leave. Right, I think you mentioned a section like this that was fairly difficult. If you don't have a properly leveled Sten. Right, and I wonder how that's gonna play out later. All our elevators are operated by hand. Ouch. Yikes. Especially considering what we see later. I also like how the music keeps switching between somber and upbeat as you go through the rooms. Yeah, this is a... I don't know, it seems a little oddly built. Oh. Man, check out that music. It's a nice soundtrack. I like it. Yeah. And also introducing arguably one of the game's best villains, too. Have you noticed that we haven't had a lot of villain presence in this game? Or at least nobody that survived past the episode they were introduced in? That's true. Generally, this game just, as soon as you introduce something, generally it's done away with by the end of the, the episode. It doesn't last too long. Yeah, the game's very episodic that way. The only exception to that was the imposter from Seamafort, who by himself was actually a fairly competent, ruthless, intelligent, and even kind of smart bad guy. It's just, he was in one of the game's stupidest sections, so he didn't really get to shine all that much. Yeah, that was kind of bizarre how you had this character who was, as you said, threatening and uh, clever, but he was in this just bizarre setting of the game. <laughs> well, fortunately, this girl manages to match him in all of that, and unlike him, actually had a plan that would be a legit threat to people. Well, that's a nice change of pace for this game. Now, of course there are things you can nitpick here too, because her plan of sending everyone to their dooms on too many failing fronts doesn't make a lot of sense when you see what her plan is later. But you could write your way around those with some creative thinking. Maybe? She's just insane. Yeah, that's a... Actually, you know what? That's a likely explanation too. Or maybe she just likes killing people. Who knows? Oof. She's genre savvy. Instead of trying to fight us, she just got rid of us another way. Kind of strange how... I, I think this is the, like the second time that they have like this trapdoor. <laughs> Anyways, I guess it's a good thing Sten was out of our party guess he's gonna come to the rescue. Yeah, that's a... Uh, it's gonna make for an interesting section. Also, could you imagine if we came here fused with Sonomo and his fur was just a bright, fiery red throughout this entire thing? Could you even do that? I don't think so, right? You can. Oh, you can. That's... Do they have any different reactions? Nope. It's just kind of funny to think about. Like, they just see his fur being this 
garish bright red and still recognize him as Sten. I guess just got a really good die job. Oh, that's a shame. A lost opportunity, but... <laughs> Anyways, make sure you get the treasures down here. We've got a restorative heals all of someone's HP. We've got ourselves a Papillon, a stronger weapon than what you usually have. And we have a speed suit, just in case you didn't get one in Melodia already. Trust me, you are gonna want that speed suit and the Papillon if you're not properly leveled, and you want them in general even if you are, but especially if you aren't, because this next boss fight coming up will just grind you into the ground. Just stomp you into the ground in one of the game's most infamous sections. In fact, we're actually going to lose the first round of this just because that's faster. Which is why we deposited our gold. Anyways, here's Turvo. Um, well, I say here's, relatively speaking. I, we can't see him yet. At first I thought it was a ghost, because I can't see him, but he's just hiding. You know, that would have actually been a really clever twist, now that I think about it. Maybe. Like, it, it would fit into uh, Sten's character arc here, for reasons that will be revealed very shortly in the, uh, well, right now. Oof, Sten ran out on them, huh? Uh-oh. Alright, so for this one, we're gonna you want to use the pretend command and just let Trubo kill us. You could also end the fight if you uh, took four actions, but this is quicker. So you have to lose that battle, right? Or you have to last for four turns. Either one will do, I just lost it because it was faster. Right. Also, the reason he did so much damage was, one, he crit on both attacks. He uh, has a 50% crit rate. But the other thing is that the pretend command halves your defense, which ratcheted up his damage output significantly. So why would you... Yeah, like, is this pretend command ever useful for anything that's other than this? Well, it's supposed to change the targeting priority so that Sten is less likely to be attacked. So basically, no, it's never useful. It does, however, tie into his character nicely because, as you see here, Sten launched what looked like a suicide attack and then played dead at the convenient moment so he could survive this horrific battle of Goofheim. Right, so it ties in with his character, that's nice. And then after that, he ditched Highland and just sort of tried to run away by being this goofball magician traveling from place to place. It's interesting. I think Stan in general is one of the more appealing characters of this game. Always to me. Me as well, buddy. Now, this fight isn't so hard. Despite what Turbo said, you actually have five turns to beat him. Or rather, four and a half, because the fight ends after Sten's fifth action. But we don't need that much, because we can just KO him with two fire blasts, and it's not a problem. Since we got all our good armor on, he can't even do that much damage. Right, so I imagine if you were lower level, this fight would turn out a lot different. Oh, it would. So different, we're actually going to make a bonus episode on that after all is said and done here. I can imagine. And that was also a very cool transition. Like, both of those battles, I feel, were nicely done. Like, you had them falling from the tower, and then the falling platforms. Awesome, isn't it? 
Yeah, those were very climactic. Also, what did you think of being able to see that red bar at long last? Well, I enjoyed it. Yeah. So, I didn't actually know if the speed shoes or the initiative glitch or the how the holy scarf worked until after the LP was all finished and done. So from here on out, you're looking at an entirely redone set of videos where I incorporated those strats. Because I also discovered something in the final dungeon that made it significantly faster. And a mistake that I... That came to bite me in one of the other dungeons, so enough stuff changed that it warranted re-recording. So... Now you're finally getting to see some of the extra stuff that I also incorporated since I had the idea. Like, instead of having the HP just in numbers, you see it as a red bar going down. Which you don't normally get to see unless you've killed at least one of that same type of enemy. Which is obviously impossible for the bosses. That is some good work on your part. <laughs> Thank you. Also, back to the plot. It turns out there's a princess and Spooke has something nasty planned out for her and that's our saving the princess is going to be our next objective. That's nice. Although it does bring into question again as to who's actually running the show. Like, is it the princess or is it Spooke? You would think the princess, but I guess not. Or maybe Spooke did something to depose her, who knows? Could just be the both of them working together, I suppose. Ooh. You're, th you're thinking the princess is, uh, darker than she appears? Maybe. I see. I guess we'll just have to go ahead and find out. Anyways, um, since you're a bit dinged up from tr Turvo, you want to check out that pond to heal your HP and AP. Also save your progress, because there's one enemy here with an instant death spell that we can't kill in one turn. So, just as a precaution, you want to save there. You imagine just losing all your progress because some random enemy just one-shot you. Mm. This isn't one of the more well-loved segments of the game as far as just gameplay. Yeah, it's also a good idea to just um, save every time you can, because no autosave. Yeah, like we've gotten used to that. Well, you guys have. Me, I'm always stuck in the past, so... Also, there are lots of treasures a thousand zenny chests that you could get, but I'm going to be skipping most of them just in favor of running to the very end. Because of guys like these, the Deathbringers, these are the instant death enemies I was telling you about. Now watch what happens here. Ooh! Oh, oh, oh! We revived! Yay! Now, that is especially noteworthy, because, first of all, your chances of reviving after being killed, you only have like a 25% chance to even get that chance to start with. And then even after that, you're relying on a hidden gut stat out of 256 to actually revive. So what you saw there was both an incredible streak of good luck and an incredible streak of bad luck. So, what would the total chance to revive be? Something like 10%? I think so. Probably even less than that, to be honest. That's fairly small. Indeed. Also, since we're out of AP, we could use a Wisdom Seed to gain back 20 AP, but that would hurt us for 20 HP, so instead we use the fire spices that we brought along from now on, since they have the same damage and effect. 
I find it almost humorous that you can carry like so many fire spices, which could you can't like have a stack of them. You just have to have just like one by one. I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, like. Like, imagine how busted they would be if you could just have stacks of nine, like you could with most gear. Yeah, I can definitely see why they uh, chose not to. Maybe they become explosive if you pack them together. Oof, indeed. Oh, so we're gonna get these treasures, because the Hawk Claw enhances Rand's offense which will meaningfully speed up fights and turn some damage ranges into KOs. Also the Assassin for Sten, same deal. But there's some other Zenny chests that we're skipping, so we fight less enemies like this. The Pharaoh Mage, which has an Ice Blast spell that does over 100 ice damage. One of the other reasons why you want Sten properly leveled before coming here. See, you didn't see it happen there, but it could have. Right, so was there any reason you picked the right path in that forked path? Because it's the right way to go. That's about it. Right. Oh, here's the princess. Now let's see if Skyzo's right about her. It's a menacing machine. More so than their hand operated elevators. Also, as interesting as a villainous princess would have been, it would seem she's on the good side. Bummer. True. Also, one other thing I should mention, if you don't have the holy knife against those pharaoh enemies, you'll want to use a second fire blast or fire spice, because th that holy knife does double damage, so it does more than either the Papillon or the Assassin Knife, despite having lower attack power. So just keep that in mind. Minor optimizations. Also some cool lines from Spooke here. It's true. I wonder if we'll fight her now. With Justin? It'll be kind of impossible, I imagine. Actually, it would... Actually, yeah. Yeah, it would. If for just one reason. Yeah, but then, like, how are we gonna get out of this? Just escape? No, that's how. Of course she has another trapdoor set up. <laughs> oh, well. Anyways, that's about it for this episode. This has been Fiona Dayquester signing out. Join us tomorrow to see how we resolve this Highland arc. See ya later, and have a night, and God bless you. Okay, I'll see you later, YouTube. Bye!